Okay, we may begin, Dr. Pasta. Thank you very much, Edo. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to our third archaeology webinar series of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Traces Asia. This webinar is jointly hosted and facilitated by Aido Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rixa Fuentes, and myself. This webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, and the RIT and its Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. Let me introduce our speaker today. Professor John Peterson from the University of San Carlos, who is actually joining us from the field and who has kindly agreed to present a lecture with the title, Reading Visayan Landscapes, Environmental History and Archaeology in the Central Philippines. Dr. John Peterson is the president of the International Committee on Archaeological Heritage Management of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, and director of the Micronesian Area Research Center. He's also a faculty member of the Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History at the University of San Carlos. Dr. Peterson is furthermore a research scientist at the National Museum of the Philippines, history flight, and extant heritage advisors. John is a specialist in heritage preservation and has extensive experience in the policy making and application of heritage and restoration projects. He has served on the State Board of Review, Texas Historical Commission for six years, the State of Hawaii Preservation Board, and is currently serving on the Guam Historic Preservation Board. He has been a leader in the community heritage preservation in the Spanish colonial landscapes in the Philippines, as well as in Guam and Micronesia. In his research, he has focused on landscape archeology span and historical ecologies in the Philippines and island Southeast Asia, the Western Pacific and the US. He has conducted numerous archeological and ethnographic fieldwork projects cultural resource studies and impact assessments. And he has extensively published on the prehistory and archeology span of central Philippines on the history of early Spanish settlements in the Philippines and the Western Pacific, as well as on the Ifugao rice terraces and on early exchange systems and colonialism, just to name a few topics. It is a great pleasure having Dr. Peterson today in our webinar. And I will now hand over to Mylene, uh, who will also uh, say a few words of introduction about John. Thank you, Alfred. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar of this semester uh, series. So uh, this afternoon, like Alfred said, we have John Peterson with us. And we are really so fortunate uh, to have someone like John, who is a global scientist, a global citizen, and at the same time, an expert in archaeology, who's working with us and has interest in the archaeology of the Philippines. So thank you very much, John, for being with us, and we look forward to your talk. I turn you over now to Dr. Rick Fuentes for the abstract. Good afternoon, everyone. So today's talk is about the Visayas, which have been the site for archaeological studies since the 1920s that have contributed to our knowledge of the archaeology, testing of practice and theory, and recently also of environmental history in the region. This presentation provides a brief account of prior work with a focus then on current investigations and findings. So again, for this afternoon's talk, titled Reading Visayan Landscapes, Environmental History and Archaeology in the Central Philippines, we welcome Dr. John A. Peterson. 
Uh, thank you very, very much. Like Alfred said, we're, we're out in the field. We took a break from doing some soil coring this morning and the courtesy of the Golden Sands Resort, which has pretty good Wi-Fi, unlike most of the northern part of Cebu, we're presenting now on their, uh, their Wi-Fi and uh, uh, we deeply appreciate their support. Um, we're here because we're being supported by a, a really nice uh, fellowship grant from the uh, National Museum and Andonia Boatis, who's a current board member of the National Museum, um, to do an archeological project on North Cebu, the North Cebu Archaeological Program. And that's including a collection of paleoenvironmental uh, coring that'll be used uh, by uh, Max Planck Institute in Jena and by uh, Rebecca Hamilton at the uh, Australian National University. And I'll show you uh, some of that work we're doing toward the end of this uh, presentation. But let me leap in here, if I can get situated, I'll share the screen. And you should be seeing the title slide now. I'm reading the Cyan Landscapes, Environmental History and Archaeology in the Central Philippines. You're all very aware, I'm sure, of uh, uh, what we mean by the Visayas stretching from Panay on the west uh, and then over to the east, and including in the center Cebu and, and uh, Negros Oriental and Negros Occidental, Bohol Island, etc. Um, it's a vast region, but it's also very connected. And we, we didn't really realize how much so until we started doing these projects. Um, this disc, for example, was found in our first season of excavation at San Hermigio uh, as a group with Stephen Acabado, Jobers Versalis, Ami Garang from the museum. They had dug a, a, a bit earlier, but this, this disc was found on a burial during that dig. And now in a current excavation in the last year in July and August, we found more of discs similar to this, and uh, Jobers found in a museum collection uh, from Manila uh, a disc found in Gigantes, which is a straight, straight shot across the sea. I can see that direction from where I'm sitting right now. So this, this area of the Visayas may have shared an identity uh, in earlier times uh, that uh, maybe some other parts of the Philippines uh, don't uh, have uh, quite so much obvious uh, uh, iconography to share like that, but we seem to be finding more and more of a shared identity. And this goes back to what I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit, Bill Solheim's Colony, um, Iron Age uh, archaeology and so forth that seem to be linking uh, sites throughout this region. Uh, I, I do mainly uh, landscape archaeology or uh, historical ecology, and coming to Cebu has been a fascinating uh, opportunity. I've been coming since about 2000, the year 2000, and uh, have been very, uh, have learned an enormous amount about archaeology from here in the Philippines. But we've got an, an interesting situation with settlement in the highlands and the lowlands around, as, as with many places around the world. Um, but when uh, Pegafeta and others came into the region uh, 500 some years ago, uh, they noted all the stilt houses along the shoreline and they assumed everybody was living on the shore. But uh, we actually are finding, as you can see from this, this more recent map of the uh, interior of the Philippines, there's an enormous amount of settlement in the highlands. And uh, we're trying to develop models to, to understand that settlement. Uh, when we survey in the mountains, we find scattered sherds all over, but very few very dense settlements. But then down along the shore itself, they will be sometimes quite dense. But what we've learned from ethnographic work and, and some uh, recent early modern period archeology span is that people were highly mobile during this time. They were living all over the place and probably going back and forth from the sea to the mountains, maybe several times in a day. Um, and also they were very mobile by sea, as you all know. Uh, and uh, a few thousand years before that, there were many phenomena of people uh, moving into island Southeast Asia from mainland Southeast Asia and settling along shorelines, but probably also using the whole landscape. Chronologies, of course, are extremely important everywhere we work and we, we try to build chronologies. We've been not very successful in the Philippines though. As you know, all part of it's the, the, the lack of systematic studies. Most, most of us don't get around to that many sites in our careers. Uh, but if you can read this, you'll see everything from buyers early, very broad categories to Bill Solheim's much more elaborate, 1950s era, but published again in 2000. 
and Rosa Tanasis, who worked at San Carlos uh, in the 70s. We'll see some of her work later. Laura Juncker, who worked in Negros and, and uh, made much of uh, what she believed to be chiefdoms there. She had a very detailed chronology, uh, but we think mostly it's, it's very vague. And, and most times among archeologists, we talk about the Neolithic and the Iron Age and the Porcelain Age in those terms, because we just don't have more definite information. And I would submit the one reason for that is that we may not have a really a sequential chronology here. Uh, rather, we may have various uh, coeval traditions or horizons and maybe need to be thinking about settlement in that way, that there may be many different uh, cultural affiliations of people who are interpenetrating in different regions and maybe people who are traveling throughout the region very extensively. Like I said, Bill Solheim talked about uh, uh, the Kalanai, an Iron Age uh, phenomenon, a group of people living from around 2,500 years ago to at least 1,000, maybe 1,500 years ago. We, we don't have really good information on that. But here in northern Cebu, we're getting more and more data on that period. And I think we're going to have, uh, uh, from burials and also sites that we're finding on survey, I think we're going to have some, some, something to say about that period, at least in the summer by the time we're in the middle of this project. Um, you, of course, are in Luzon. Those are in the, who are in the north that are listening uh, have been very uh, fortunate to have found early sites in the Kalinga site, very, very early, of course, and uh, at Kaliao Cave. Uh, nothing like that's been found yet in the Visayas, but I'll show you some efforts we've made to try to connect to that. Um, one thing, of course, of, that was helpful with the Kalinga site was the finding of tectites there, showing a 700,000-year-old land surface. But we've now found tectites here in, in Cebu. Bayer had list, listed a, a couple of sites in his uh, book on tectites, but we have uh, around Badian found tectites. And we're looking at uh, landforms like this, a, a Karkar formation, Pliocene uh, to late Pleistocene land surface. And the tectites are exposed in the, uh, in the soil there, uh, uh, but they're in a deflated surface. So we've got a lot more work to do to, 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 to understand that. And we're always, of course, looking for tectites. Uh, but of course, we haven't been fortunate to find yet something out on top of the ground. We'll keep looking, of course. Um, we did a project, some of you will recall a few years ago, to look for old settlement data from the Maragondon Cave, 40 meters below the surface offshore uh, at Plantation Bay in, uh, uh, west, uh, in, in eastern uh, Macban Island. Uh, when we started working there, some people said, uh, what, you're crazy, people are, don't live 40 meters below the sea in a cave. But we, we pointed out to them that actually there's a a long history of sea level change up and down. And as you can see from these figures, uh, some of the sea level changes along with tectonic uplift on the left or on the left slide or part of the slide shows periods when coral reef platforms were forming 100,000, 200, 300,000 years ago. On the right, you can see periods of sea level rise and fall from a line above and below the present level. Uh, relative to those uh, features. And uh, at Maragondon Cave, we did get enough information to be able to determine that that coral reef platform that's about 40 meters below surface up to about 20 meters below surface formed about 120,000 years ago. Uh, but then during the last glacial maximum was 20 meters, uh, 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 the sea level was 20 meters below, or excuse me, it was 140, 140 meters below present level. And so the cave was fully exposed during the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. But now, of course, the sea level has risen and is uh, back at the zero or slightly, was slightly above and has come back down. So now the cave is 40 meters below sea level. But what we're hopeful for is with, we've been able to characterize the cave and its age we know there are deposits, uh, we got down as deep as about 3,500 year old deposits in the muck in the floor of the cave. And we're hoping to have a, a, a project sometime and we can go back and do some serious dredging and maybe get down to some older uh, levels there. We've also worked along the shorelines here all up and down the coast. And in Ocaña, we were fortunate to find exposed in cut banks of the Ocaña River uh, paleosols that had pottery showing these features here and also showed us that as we modeled sea level rise, which was actually about two meters higher than today, 
up until about a couple of thousand years ago and then fell back down. We can use sites like this as they're exposed in the cut bank to, to find out where people were living. And these are like tropoquips, they're wetland soils. So people were living in stilt houses in mangrove swamps. And we know that from the paleo environmental information uh, that we recorded on the caves. Uh, this shows a little more detail on the, on the pottery. It's kind of this typical, uh, we would generally say iron age uh, decorations, but they fall nicely into Solheim's uh, 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 description of the, of the colony period or the Sawin colony. And you can see the paleosol on the left. We'll look at some other paleosols in a bit, but they're very useful for learning about the uh, environmental changes in human settlement here in the region. We did a lot of environmental work, uh, uh, pollen and phytoliths and uh, starch residues, and we, we can characterize the environments uh, from this one. We can see that there were mangroves and a number of other uh, permanent uh, trees that were part of, a we believe, a very extensive agroforestry system. Um, and, and so all the work we do, we try to do controlled uh, profiles and columns uh, for radiocarbon dating and for uh, paleoenvironmental information. We're also looking at sites that emerge on the seashore. And again, if you look at where these coconuts are, that's about uh, a little over two meters at grassy from level from the mean sea level uh, above present. And in eroding out from that is a site that comes roughly from that same period, uh, maybe two to three to 4,000 years ago. And you can see there chipstone tools and, and uh, uh, both red slipped and plain uh, pottery, sometimes decorated pottery. But these sites are a wealth of information. You can see how it's coming out of the exposure. Uh, we look at them as shoreline sites around this period, two, maybe the three to 4,000 years ago. We haven't gotten a date on this one yet, so we're not really sure. Um, this shows the, the, the changes in sea level. Uh, if you look at the uh, little purple area in the middle, you can see that with present sea level, it's actually uh, quite a bit above sea level and far from the shore. But two to three to 4,000 years ago, the, the sea was quite a bit higher. And you can see how much of the shoreline is lost during that period. Um, but anyway, this is the extent of sea level. And so it's a great marker for studying that period uh, and gives us a lot of uh, good information. Other kinds of sites that we've found are like this one in Okanya, which is actually about the same age as that paleosol I just show you. So we had a settlement site along with what we believe to be a ritual site in the highlands above Okanya. You saw it was on a very high hill. Rosa Tenasis first dug this site in, 1970, in the 1970s. Uh, she was taken there by a, a, a Vietnam vet that married a Filipina and, cruised around on the hill slopes, found adzes and pottery, found this site, joined a class at San Carlos and the whole class dug it. And uh, uh, Rosa, I think very correctly saw it as a ritual site and also as a, a child burial site. We had the good fortune to work in Tangu uh, several years ago and witnessed a Subanan ritual of uh, uh, rising in the full moon, but also constellations on a high hill site above Tangu. And uh, we saw a altar very much like the one you see on the left in the lower left corner picture that Emerson Christie recorded from about 1910, I think. Uh, these are very, these resonate also with sites that were found by uh, uh, and described by Faye Cooper Cole in the, among the Bukid known. And uh, they are, are basically ritual sites where people would dance around the altars they would drink from small jars, aguardiente, they would eat roasted eggs, they, or boiled eggs, they would eat roasted baby pigs and other items. And when we excavated on the site in Lubong, we found exactly those items and nothing else. So it's in an article that I published uh, in 2009 or so uh, in the Philippine Quarterly, but it talks about those ritual sites. Um, here's another close up of that altar, very simple but it was uh, used as an all night site for uh, dancing and observing of the constellations. And the constellations each had different uh, important events to mark for planting or harvesting or other kinds of things. We found this shirt on Lubong site. Maybe I'm stretching it a bit, but it does look sort of like uh, the belt of Orion, extremely important constellation. Uh, again, uh, I apologize for my vivid imagination. 
here's a picture of one of the altars. Now, the priest that we had come to alley on our site, bless the site. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting out of sequence here. And then we excavated uh, one of the, uh, a couple of areas that Rosa had not excavated. And, and we found, what did we find? Well, we found preserved baby pig bones. We found lots and lots of sherds, jar rim sherds, small goblet rim sherds. These are from Rosa's collection. These are some we found. Now, the interesting thing too, is that we're finding sites now, just like this in our Northern Sudu survey. Uh, we got attracted to this hilltop site near San Remigio because the name on the map, Hintorihan, made us think it maybe was a, uh, um, a tower site of some kind, or uh, maybe something to do with a high overlook, uh, just like the Okani site. And as we got up on top, we found rows of very interesting features. This is not a terrace because it's across and over the top of the hill, not, uh, not uh, parallel to the slope. Uh, and we also found lots and lots of small uh, jar rim sherds, just like the ones I showed you on the, um, the Lubong site. We also have other colonized sites like this, the Alegria cave burial site. Uh, but that period, that Iron Age period, as Bill would have identified it, uh, uh, ended in a, in a flourish with really fabulous pottery and fabulous sites like the Magsuho site, which Rosa also uh, did uh, the type excavation on. Um, in Negros. Uh, and you can see that the pottery by the end of that period had become very elaborate. Maybe people here were sharing something uh, with a broader region, but they had certainly articulated a very, very elegant uh, pottery style. Uh, and uh, then following that, if we're looking sort of chrono chronologically, and again, I'm trying to not trying to look at it, this is sequential, but as sort of sometimes overlapping and parallel uh, settlement systems or, or, or cultural affiliations. One of the first projects I worked on here in the Visayas was a, uh, a site at the site of Salub. Church built outside of Cebu City in 1599, uh, 22 or three, something like that almost like a shipwreck in that sense. It's two decades, but a very, very brief uh, window of time on the period. And we found uh, uh, these uh, walls from the, uh, um, we found these walls from the settlement, but we also uh, uh, found a, a paleosol that is quite interesting because we were able to get radiocarbon dates bracketing this to from 1000 to 1200 AD. Uh, and the uh, implications of that are that that was a period of, of climatic stability, environmental stability. It was, it was the walls of the church were built into it, so it wasn't coeval with the church, but it was a period when we think there was a fluorescence of settlement in the area. We begin to see Song Dynasty pottery traded in by the end of that period, some maybe early Yuan pieces start appearing. And the other thing is that this was the source of a clay that was used by modern day potters in a book on near, uh, near Karkar. Um, and we found, actually, we did a, an ICPMS study of the pottery, of the constituents of the pottery. We had sherds from the floor of the church. We had sherds from sites up in the highlands above us. And we had sherds from the uh, Abuhan modern potters that used that site for, uh, for clay. And we found that uh, actually they were uh, uh, that the, the, the church on the floor of the church did not at all match the clay site, even though it was right next to the, to the church. Instead, uh, the, the, of course, the Obugan potter's uh, clay matched it exactly. Uh, their pottery matched the clay exactly. And some from Bohol across the straits that Andrea Jankowski provided matched it exactly. Um, but the fact that the ones on the floor of the church did not make us think that this was evidence for, uh, that for the failure of the reduccion. Uh, by the parishes, that people were brought to the churches, maybe they came occasionally, but they weren't living there much because they weren't using a local clay source, they continued to use clay sources that were probably from the highlands. And in fact, these in the floor of the church match some of those in the highlands instead. So an interesting thing, 
uh, that, that we could reflect on based on looking at uh, some of the chemical characteristics of the pottery. Now, this picture is uh, probably the golden age of archaeology in Cebu. Uh, this was the sloop that Carl Gutha lived on for a couple of years. He used this to uh, travel around Cebu, up throughout the Visayas and down into Mindanao. Um, he was basically had been invited by uh, Dean Worcester, who had made arrangements with the University of Michigan to support him. And of course, you all know about his fabulous uh, survey. It was biased. Unfortunately, they were, they, they were showing people in villages a handful of porcelain pottery. So those are typically the kinds and periods of sites that they found. But nonetheless, he compiled a re great record of over 500 sites, many he excavated. And so there's a great body of knowledge there about the region, at least from the older period. Now we're sort of still seriously scouting the earlier, uh, hopefully uh, Iron Age and Neolithic uh, periods uh, to find more from those areas because these weren't included in his survey. Uh, Carl Hutcher worked with Rosa Tenasis on a famous site in the uh, Magallanes Street area of downtown Cebu and uh, published a great uh, monograph on the uh, stilt houses of, uh, of the region and uh, uh, very good stratigraphy showing that uh, uh, this was from actually from the period of uh, uh, early pre-colonial, but uh, uh, in the same early modern era that later was to see Spanish uh, residents come to the area, but some of these were Yuan vessels. Uh, and so it was a, it was a really great eye opener for everyone to see this density of settlement down in the area around, uh, um, down in the area around downtown. So um, one of the things that we look at during that period is the contacts with the Philippines. And it's, it's, uh, we didn't really have a very good idea on it until uh, Roderick Patak, a German scholar, translated a number of Chinese uh, 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 shipping manifests and bills of lading and was able to reconstruct patterns of trade through the region. And one of the things we learned from his work and some other historians working on the era is that there were uh, very early trade routes going into the southern Philippines, the green lines, even during the uh, uh, period of the Majapahit, and in fact, then the the Yuan Dynasty, there was an invasion of the of the, of the Majapahit at, where they were defeated. Uh, but there was a a, a very uh, 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 dense trade going into the area around Butuan, and then down the line trading back. And then later, it was much later. It was when Moro traders uh, emerged, uh, basically in affiliation with the Brunei Sultanate that we begin to see movement from along the red lines into the northern parts of the Philippines. So we're getting a lot better information on that. Uh, and that's helping to kind of understand the flow of, of porcelain in trade through the region, uh, but also to understand some of the trading products that we're leaving. And also probably also to understand the significance of Butuan as a site. Uh, the boats that were found there uh, are a, a, a very important archeological find and they link them in Butuan with, a, with an expansive world trade as early as a thousand uh, years ago. We've, we've had another recent project in uh, near, near downtown Cebu City. Uh, many of you know or have heard a little about our Jesuit house archeology. span Jimmy C invited us there and uh, he and others provided some support. Archie Tiazon was the uh, site director and the, and the lab director and uh, we found uh, an amazing uh, quantity of materials, I think over 8,000 artifacts, and uh, including the porcelain from several periods on the left, but also some very unique, very distinctive pottery. This is from like very late pre-Spanish or early Spanish period. We're not sure um, if it's something made in the Philippines. Is it like Manila ware? <coughs> John Mixick at first thought this might actually have been something coming from Myanmar. Uh, we're not sure. We're still exploring the source of this pottery, but we found it here and, and not much and not many other sites in the region. The stratigraphy there at the Jesuit house, where we dug units below where they were replacing um, Malabi posts in the subfloor of the house, uh, you can see uh, down around 140 centimeters below the ground level, uh, we run into a, a very high density mostly of uh, Wanli period, late uh, Ming dynasty uh, pottery, and uh, uh, the Spanish had already come, but below that is a marshy deposit, 
very interesting and the artifact drop count drops way off. And in that marshy deposit, we, we learned that actually the Jesuit house, which is now pretty far inland in Liparian, was actually a shoreline site on a marsh in the area. A lot of great discoveries. Mike, Mike Herrera right now has chicken bones we found there that he's uh, uh, working on to look at the genetic connections. Uh, a number of like brackish water or mangrove swamp uh, uh, shell types that were harvested and consumed on the site, Gepararium and Anadara. Uh, the, the core horn cores of a, of a tamarau from about uh, maybe late 1400s. And of course, uh, pigs and other uh, animals we found there. Wan Lee coin showing the period very clearly. And a toddy, you can see down in the lower right, which is one of the first uh, artifacts of cockfighting that we that we know of in the Philippines, and it would have been from the late pre-Spanish deposits. Uh, we also found a number of uh, wooden uh, arm-sized uh, posts in the ground uh, in a line across the whole basement floor of the uh, Jesuit house, and the radiocarbon dates correspond closely. You can see them in this image. Um, and we think that this might have been part of a coastline uh, fishing corrals or fishing structures. And we've done some work on that to try to uh, um, elaborate that interpretation. We've even done some ethnographic work in the uh, uh, Taiyud area. Uh, some students went out and worked with the fishermen there on the fishing structures. And we think that they may have been there. Uh, there were also oysters growing on some of them when the oysters were intact and in place. And we got a lot of good cross dating from radio carbon. Um, we also did a little project nearby at the uh, uh, Casa, uh, 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 Casa Gerardo. Uh, they had an annex under construction next to Casa Gerardo that the Avoides Foundation supported some archaeological monitoring on. You can see from this that the lower right date, we get some very early dates. And we now have uh, pollen art uh, phytoliths and, and starch uh, residue analysis from that. And we have uh, rice starch in that oldest deposit there. So we didn't find intact rice grains or rice blooms or anything, but there is rice starch. Starch can move up and down in a column. It depends on how stable the column is, but this is a, a, an anoxic uh, glade uh, 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 deposit at the base of the, uh, at the base of the marsh. Uh, this would have been in the middle of the marsh that the Jesuit house was on the shoreline of. And uh, so it, it may well have been in a stable within the area in which it was uh, found. Um, we used all this information to go back and re-examine uh, many of the uh, uh, assertions that uh, Masao Nishimura made in his fabulous dissertation work in the 1980s in Cebu. Uh, his, his soil profile is there in the middle of the image and uh, you can see there that there was, uh, uh, if, you can, if you study this, you'll see that there were uh, different uh, areas where the uh, uh, so intact uh, soil development was taking place. If, in, in the areas around Santo Nino Church and Fort San Pedro, we have soil development, uh, very deep, very, very stable landforms. But many other areas away from there, we begin to find maybe uh, not very well-developed soils, if at all. And it's some of those that we'll be looking at because we've been able to reconstruct a river pattern of relic channels of the Guadalupe River. We started with a current, a contemporary hazards map on the upper left. And you can see that they also identified these same channels on the right within the city. And then in our uh, LIDAR imagery in the lower right hand corner, you can see we've been able to reconstruct some of these channels relative to the modern sites. Um, and it shows a couple of very interesting things. One, the yellow area was probably the limit of the two meter higher sea stand. All the blue or much of that blue may have been underwater up until a couple of thousand years ago. And then uh, uh, we can also trace some of the channels out that, uh, that were stranding uh, in interfluve environments, meaning between the drainages were the high grounds that would have uh, supported soil formation on which uh, the Spanish, of course, first uh, built uh, their sites, but probably the native villages were also located. And now I'll go to another uh, project right before we, we head back to North Cebu. Uh, in the Patria, uh, 
uh, area across from the Cebu Cathedral, and uh, then it was destroyed during the war by aerial uh, uh, bombing, and it was uh, just completely devastated, and so it was cleared. By 1954, uh, the Patria, which was a hospice and offices area for the diocese, was constructed. But recently it was decided that had outlived its usefulness and it was uh, sold and partly raised. Uh, credit to the builders and the diocese and everybody else, the front facade was maintained and kept because it represents some of the history, recent but important history of Cebu. Um, but the rest in the back will turn into a, a residential tower and commercial tower. Uh, and in the courtyard, we found remnants of the bishop's residence but we also found some really other and some other really interesting things. So we went in when when the geo coring, which I'll show you in a minute, was uh, was done for the project. We noticed some really interesting features, and so we followed these giant boring machines in that are being used to build pilings. But then the the the, the foundation for the structure. Uh, if you look at the the boring uh, or uh, log or the the geotechnical investigations, you'll see a really dense clay. Uh, let's see if this pointer will reach here. A really dense clay down in this zone here. And that's that's pretty deep. That's like anywhere from 10 to 15 meters below the present uh, uh, before the present ground surface. And within those clays, we, we were hoping to find uh, maybe uh, at least some environmental history, but also maybe some clays that we could use for dating and for uh, paleoenvironmental uh, information. And boy, we hit a bonanza. These, these really thick blue clays are just ideal for preservation of pollen. And they're also, there's enough carbon in these to get dates from. So you can see where we have the yellow marked, the yellow highlighted areas are where they did some test borings early on. We collected uh, clays from those zones and then we did radiocarbon dating on them. And we found a really fabulous story. Basically inland, the, the uh, uh, clay was dating to about 5,000 some years ago, but further out in what would have been the sea, the clay was dating to as, as old as 8,000 years ago. But the lower level, level of the inland uh, coring uh, dated to again about 8,000. So we see a transgression uh, uh, from uh, a transition from the, the full glacial sea level 22,000 years ago up through uh, this near shore environment now. 10 to 15 meters below sea level uh, that was hosting a, a, a coastal marsh. Uh, we don't know yet how that'll be characterized. Rebecca Hamilton has the soils from this, has samples of, this, of the clays, and uh, we'll be very much looking forward to seeing what, uh, what kind of uh, paleoenvironmental picture we get at that period from her detailed work. And uh, that, of course, will join with some of the findings that she'll have been making here in the North Cebu area. Um, Um, now we're going to shift to hold on a sec to the uh, to the north. That's what I was expecting. Uh, on some of the sites that we're finding in the north, uh, we're making some really uh, very interesting observations. On the right is a, is a picture of an obsidian nodule. Now we've been led to believe for a long time there was no obsidian uh, formed in the Philippines and that any obsidian that's found was brought in from far away. And in fact, in one or two of the earliest articles, I think Matthew Spriggs thought this, that the obsidian here looked like it matched the source in Vanuatu. Uh, we thought there must have been closer sources. Uh, well, it looks like uh, in one of the rivers near Katmon, we may now have one and maybe we can track this down to find uh, more material in the ground. Um, the geologist from PSU, uh, uh, Christina Forilio is here on our project right now, helping with the coring, and she's going to assist us looking at some of these deposits. And thanks also to maybe some other areas that she knows of, like around Mount Mayan or my own volcano and others. On the left, you see a, uh, a pottery uh, piece of pottery that was found in uh, one of the sites near the shore, and this is this is the possible obsidian source here. And I seem to have confused some slides, but I, I did have a picture of that first, uh, I had an image of the first Solheim uh, slide that showed the uh, 
pottery from the uh, Kalanai period. And this, this is the dead ringer for one of the decorations on one of the rims of one of those pottery uh, that I showed in that earlier slide. Uh, the obsidian, the obsidian and the family that had it. This is in, in the Bagatayam River where the gentleman said he had found it uh, and there may be some volcanic deposits there. There, there is said to have been a volcano there, and very long ago, extinct volcano. There are lots of springs, but there's also a fabulous hot springs uh, at Hisol High in the uh, mountains above Katmon. And these sources we need to examine to see what, uh, what, what there might be, with, what possibilities there might be for uh, obsidian sources in the area. Now, we're staying at this Golden Sands Resort. Here we are looking out over the shore. And in this picture to the right, we're standing on the hilltop above where we are right now, looking out to the sea, which was very heavily developed by a much earlier resort development. But all the pottery on the left came from on top of this hill. Uh, we're going to be examining it, in fact, later today. But uh, I think we have another dead ringer for a hilltop ritual site. It has a wonderful view out to the northeast where the rising moon and rising constellations could be observed and the incredible density of sherds with jar rims and so forth is, is uh, really impressive. And there are some rock features, uh, large uh, boulders up on top that may be parts of uh, rock features. Uh, they don't look like they're part of the natural landscape. We'll be examining that later. But it, 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 uh, it, uh, it seems that there's a whole, in every major uh, community, in every major uh, area, within the Visayas so far, we find something like this. And we haven't even begun to walk up on all the hills yet, <laughs> but uh, I think we are, uh, we're onto something with these, uh, with these special use ritual sites. And in the river below, you, you see a little village over between the resort and Tapilon. Uh, we have already found a pottery in the stream bed there, maybe a, a significant village there. Uh, we've documented many now in the areas of uh, coastal areas of, of the northern part of Cebu around San Remigio and, and south to Tehuelan and then on the east side uh, from, from Capmon and Sogud north up into uh, Bourbon and, and Bogo. Um, so we know that there are also sites in the highlands. Going back to that original slide with the highlands and the density of settlement there, I think we're, uh, we can walk and walk and walk and, and I think uh, the same can be said of Laura Juncker's Highlands surveys in Negros. Well, you find a scatter of sherds all over. To me, it seems to uh, represent more of a kind of a dispersed uh, Sweden settlement system. Uh, but rarely is there a dent, an area of dense pottery or dense settlement uh, found in the Highlands. So I think uh, uh, we need to rely upon performance they go to selected locales uh, and more and more try to target where we say uh, with expectations for fine island sites. But uh, uh, I think we'll be looking for stranded Danao up in the mountains and also uh, pockets of arable land along drainages where typically we will find a little bit of pottery, but again, rarely in any density, in any great density. The more dense sites seem to be right along the shore, and we're documenting them now and beginning to excavate them here in the North Cebu. So that's um, that's a lot. Uh, it's a real mouthful, and uh, I've taken you over a lot of a lot of time and a lot of area in a fairly brief period. But that's kind of a status report on our current work, and uh, a picture of where we're going in the uh, in the near future. And and uh, given enough time, we'll keep exploring these common themes of environmental history of uh, chronology, uh, what's the character of the chronology? Is it in fact sequential or is it uh, more of a, uh, a question of horizons and traditions that I'm, I'm beginning to think? And if so, then how can we relate the interactions of peoples? I mean, there are many, many, many fascinating questions and uh, the work has uh, been going on for, well, 70 years, but it's really in many ways just beginning. much. I'm going to stop sharing. And I think I'm back. Alfred? All right. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and, and for, for introducing us to, to this extremely rich archaeological landscape, to this, this, this amazing site density that, that you presented. It must be, must be wonderful to, to do field work in that area and, and with all the pleasant surroundings, <laughs> I would say. Yes. So, uh, uh, I, I definitely envy you, especially now uh, after uh, two years of, of being more or less uh, locked up at home. Yeah, we were talking earlier for the rest of the audience and here in Cebu in the north, there's been very, very low uh, incidence of COVID. And so we, we came up to do some for, well, we're practicing social distancing and masking, of course, and then not, you know, our, our vaccinations and boosters and so forth. Um, but we've had a we've had a, we had a couple of months last summer, and now we're back in the field. And right now, there have been no cases in many of these communities for many weeks now. So we're hopeful. Uh, I think the advice of the local medical people is uh, relax but be vigilant. <laughs> so we're keeping that in mind. That's that's really good. Um, well, that. Uh, that that was in, in, in many ways interesting and you, and you have uh, quite a spectrum of, of finds and, and features and situations uh, over quite a long period of time. Uh, if, if I may uh, start with, with uh, the questions, um, you, you mentioned towards the end of your talk, uh, the find of, of the obsidian. And uh, of course, uh, you had, you had earlier finds, I, I think that, that you and, and Archie reported uh, from, from Alegria, from, from sites in Alegria where obsidian was found. And what, what interested me or what, what uh, is quite fascinating uh, from, from my point of view is that we found um, several obsidian artifacts in, in our site in Mindoro, in, in Bubok, Bubok 1 to be precise. And um, they have... Uh, a geochemical match uh, with obsidian that were found in Palawan at, at Ile Cave. And um, Christian Rapemeyer did uh, a few years ago, did uh, the PXRF uh, analysis on, on these obsidians. And we, we had no idea, and, and he wouldn't know where the obsidian uh, could be possibly coming from. So there, there are no sources on Palawan, no sources uh, on Mindoro. Um, and then he, he would say that obsidian that was found in Alegria has actually a very similar uh, chemical composition that could come from, uh, if not the same, but a very closely related source. Now, what, what was also interesting was the different uh, ages of these obsidians. Uh, at first, we thought that the obsidian from Mindoro and from uh, Palawan was more or less of a similar age uh, around 10, 11,000 years old. Then we, um, we got new radiocarbon dates from uh, Mindoro and that would date a layer that was above our uh, lowest obsidian finds to somewhere between 28,000 to 32,000 years ago. So that obsidian uh, seemed to be even older than, than 30,000. And uh, in, in this regard, it, it was quite fascinating uh, to, to see that uh, it appears that people from different areas have exploited the same obsidian source, wh wherever it is, uh, over a very long period of time. So now, of course, when, when uh, you found this uh, piece of obsidian and, and you suspect that there might be uh, a more closer source, somewhere in or nearby Cebu. So that, that puts a whole new light on the, on the story of those obsidian artifacts. Yeah, we were very excited. We were checking out the rock shelter where that pottery was, was, uh, was on top of a small looter's pit. Fortunately, they didn't ruin the whole, <laughs> the whole rock shelter. Um, but a gentleman, the farmer uh, said to us, you know, I have something else I'd like to ask you about. I have a I think it's a black diamond and I, I wish you'd look at it and tell me what it's worth. 
and he he pulled that out of its safekeeping and showed it to us. And Jobers and I were really excited. Uh, where did you get this? And he said, oh, Bagatayam River. I found it in the river gravels. And we're like, wow, cool. He said, yeah, actually, it was kind of down low. And it was a rock within a rock. Interesting, because it also, if you could see the surface, and it was of not a very close picture, but it was a very rugged uh, uh, surface, rugo surface on the outside of the nodule. And it, it's similar to obsidian that I used to work with in New Mexico called the Mule Creek Obsidian Source, where it, it outcropped in a rhyolite bed, but then it, it eroded into a stream and then was found even many miles downstream, but with that rugose appearance apparently from stream rolling. Uh, and, and on many sites that we worked on in that part of New Mexico, Pueblo and archaic sites, both you'd find uh, if there was still a, a, a primary part of the platform on the obsidian, you would find that that surface. So we knew it was the stream rolled Mule Creek obsidian. Anyway, this seems something very similar. So we we didn't get a chance to take him to the area. And then he started getting kind of shy because he, he thought, well, surely we're we know it's much more valuable than <laughs> it's got to be a black diamond. But he he promised, you know, he'll talk more and take us back there. But um, I don't think he picked it up in a uh, in a variety store somewhere where I'm pretty sure he did find it right there. And then also it, it directed our attention to looking at the landscape there and um, this hot spring, uh, Isoe hot spring has incredibly hot uh, pools. Um, it is a volcanic, an old volcanic landscape. And there's another one intrusive in central Cebu near Karkar, near, near where my wife's family lives. And we've been down in the stream channel there where we've actually found people panning for gold. So there's at least those two intrusive volcanic environments in Cebu, but they're not noted as uh, even volcanic, you know, cones or anything like that, but probably were lava flows, but coming up from uh, 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 upthrust and so forth. Um, any, anyway, it's a very, uh, there, there, there's a high potential that those could be a, a, an obsidian source. And we're going to, we're going to do our best to try to track that down, but we will also see if we can borrow that piece from the gentleman and we can subject it to uh, elemental analysis also yeah. and see if we can connect it with any sources. Our, the pieces on Archie's Alegria site, and we've also found, we found obsidian on the, on the Alienar site too, dating to about 2500 uh, BC. And the, the stuff on Archie's site, he was part of his uh, uh, Neolithic assemblages on uh, ridge tops. And that was some of the material that Matthew thought maybe sourced close to Vanuatu, but that was very early in the people's uh, thinking about obsidian. And there were no other sources and the Mindoro things you hadn't really found yet either. So yeah. that was very early on. It's really time to take another look at all that, I think. Uh, but hopefully also there are more sources. I always wondered why there weren't more with all the volcanic activity in Negros and, and uh, over in uh, Masbate and uh, uh, also a beacon. So we'll keep looking. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that that would be uh, very interesting. And we, we were also wondering, we did um, our analysis back then uh, when uh, Christian Rapemeyer was, was giving uh, a workshop in UP and that was, that must have been, I think 2014-ish. We, we published a paper in 2015 and by, by that time, um, and I think nothing has, has really changed. It's still, there's still no uh, obsidian sources uh, known that would match. Uh, the, the, the only two sources that um, Lineri was reporting, they, they were not a match at all uh, geochemically. And mm. our guess was also that, well, it comes from a very distant source, respectively, considering the age of the, um, the, the sites in Mindoro and in Palawan, Maybe the source is now uh, submerged, but then the, the Alegria site is, is relatively young. So if they were able to get uh, obsidian from the same source, then this is not very likely. So the source might be still somewhere out there. And so, yeah, you, you, yeah. you, you might be on the right track. Yeah. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much we've been listening to or not been listening to geologists, though, because uh, Christina seems to think that it's unusual that we haven't known of some other sources. So we may just be on the outside of that community. We need to maybe inspect those records and that research better, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yeah, that uh, is, is also very well possible. Now, now I remember that. Uh, well, we had we had in Mindoro one uh, one black diamond incident, and, and it turned out that it, it was a, a kind of a split uh, tectite. Um, and now I remember I had a discussion over over the inter internet. I, I don't know if it was through ResearchGate or Academia, um, and um, it, it was a a scientist from from France who was asking if it's not possible that uh, that obsidian or what we consider obsidian is is uh, actually tectite or work tectite. I, I found it quite unlikely, but uh, but what do you think about that? Is, is yeah, it... I, and we've seen tectites and we found tectites here too, and they they yeah. typically seem to be heavier and more metallic. And this is this is obsidian. Jobers worked with obsidian materials in Belize, which has fabulous obsidian. And I worked with it a lot in New Mexico. In fact, even this streamworm nodules. Uh, you know, there's some great stories by uh, uh, Frank Cushing, who worked for the Smithsonian and the Hemingway expedition in northern New Mexico with the Zuni in the 1880s, 70s, 80s, maybe. And uh, he worked with one of the medicine men there. And it's really interesting because he documents this in his journal. The medicine man pulled out a little piece very similar to the one we just saw and the ones from Mule Creek, just a little nodule. He was having to do some sort of delicate work to, to flay some infection out of somebody's leg and he broke the thing open and then he selected a few very, very sharp uh, blades from it. And it was a tiny piece, but he used that successfully to flay out the infection and, and to make a clean in injection, uh, in incision, and then sewed up the wound with herbs inside. And it's great, Frank Cushing describes that whole thing in his journal. I recommend the, your reading of that, uh, about the use of these. Uh, they don't seem like very significant pieces, but what can be done with them is really pretty awesome. Yeah, the, the extreme sharpness. And um, yeah, and also um, with, with regards to uh, the, the origins, what, what fascinated us was that um, the obsidians from from Mindoro and and the pieces from from uh, Ili Cave in, in El Nido, they were they, they were so alike. So they had the same color, the same tint, the same transparency. And uh, some of the flakes, they even they they appeared to be from from the same core. So uh, you would not even have needed uh, PXRF uh, analysis to to see that they come from <laughs> the same place. So it, it was so so obvious. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if yeah, if if just we would know where the where the source is, uh, I mean for for us it was already uh, good to see that we had this this triangle uh, between Palawan, Mindoro, and and Cebu, where obviously some some connection was was established through through that obsidian, and where where people at at different times uh, perhaps. Uh, had the possibility to exploit the same sources and went to the same places. Yes. Or people were moving around so much by sea on land, but certainly by sea too, that these could have yeah. been carried very, very far and very widely. I, I think uh, we have a few questions uh, in, the, in the chat box, Aido. Yes, uh, just very briefly, um, Dana, Dana is asking, hi, good afternoon, I'm based in Cebu. Are you looking for volunteers for excavations? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Um, contact us on the on the on the Facebook page, I think, for the North Cebu Archaeology uh, Project, um, or Jobers Brusalis or myself. Uh, we're hoping. I'll give you a little uh, sort of schedule ahead if it if it works out. We're going to inspect the the Kota in uh, Bantayan uh, tomorrow. Uh, the diocese is, is uh, urging us to do a little excavation there because they're fearful of some development that might uh, encroach on it. So we want to get a picture of that, at least the stratigraphic uh, 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 record, and, and maybe, maybe there may be features, we're not sure. Um, and so once we look at that, we're hoping within a few weeks to go back there and work for at least a week or so. Um, then we hope to go back to work in uh, some other sites, uh, Including that one in so good, uh, but they may wait until May. We're 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 uh, kind of trying to avoid the election period here. <laughs> um, 
closer we get to elections. In fact, most of the most of the I have to say that most of the LGUs have been extremely supportive. Uh, right now, the Anbantayan LGU is is hosting our lodging and food at the at a nearby uh, place, the Rock uh, Beach Resort. Very generous, and others in San Remigio have been extremely supportive. Um, and that will probably continue. Uh, we're thinking Bantayan will likely be very supportive. And Medellin has offered uh, support to look at a site there that uh, Jobers actually looked at several years ago, where uh, uh, he, he thinks it looked like a, a shell bracelet manufacturing site. There were tons of blanks mm -hmm. from these uh, the, the shell and then some finished bracelets. And anyway, they couldn't do much with it at the time, but uh, we're hoping to go back there. But, well, the point of this is, so the Medellin LGU is very uh, helpful. They want to support us, but they said, don't come back until late May. <laughs> right now we can't release funds. Almost all the local towns have been uh, restricted from using their budgets before the election. And uh, also there, of course, you know, could be conflicts in various communities. So we'll try to do something in Bontayan fairly soon. Uh, we, we have projected some possible excavations near this San Remigio area again, and so good. Uh, and also into Anbantayan. Once we come back later, uh, we've talked to the mayor about working in the area below the, the, uh, the Anbantayan uh, church. Uh, we've found pottery there in some disturbances. Uh, very high likelihood that there would be Spanish contact period uh, burials. These kinds of things will help us a lot to compare to, for example, to the Bohon burials in the south that Jovers worked on uh, many years ago, several years ago. Uh, so that's kind of a, a capsule picture of what we're looking for. Uh, but again, a brief period in a couple of weeks and then May for some of these others. And then in through the summer as we expand and learn of more sites. Anybody who's in the area that knows about rock shelters, of course, Alfred and I are both always keenly interested in finding rock shelters. Uh, We've found a number, many we may be testing that may have uh, intact floor deposits in, uh, but they're not on our schedule yet. Um, also, if people know about sites where pottery is eroding uh, in, in, the, in their community, we're very, very uh, eager to learn about it. Above is Soy Hot Spring, uh, a resident reported uh, Sung vessels, uh, Celadon vessels eroding out of a stream bank. And we're eager to get there. The, the day we tried to explore that, though, there was a pretty heavy rainfall and the road was mud and not developed. And we'll wait and go back, uh, you know, during a little bit drier weather. But uh, we're hearing these scattered reports and they really help us expand our knowledge of the region. So people who are out there may know of things, uh, may have been as a kid, may have seen blue and white pottery that they kicked up from a beach site. Uh, again, we're learning about these uh, mostly from from residents as we move along. Um, so yes, contact us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope uh, Dana contacts you soon. And we have another one from Athena. She's she's interested to know, are there other, other than pig bones, are there other animal remains from the ritual sites? We haven't found any other, no. But except that one site that uh, Rosa excavated on, she did find a child burial under one of the cairns. And those that burial is, is I believe, still in the San Carlos uh, collection, unless it was taken to the National Museum. So human, infant human, but also just uh, juvenile pig bones. Very interesting. And it, it certainly matches all of the attributes of the, uh, uh, of the, of the ritual sites that Faye Cooper Cole, Emerson Christie described, and that we saw on the uh, Subanan site. <clears throat> All right. Oh, and we have a question from Amel. Hi, John. Thank you, Angel. Uh, amazing work that you have been doing uh, in Cebu. And uh, thank you very much for showing us. It is just as important <laughs> as understanding the artifacts. It's also, well, you showed us the importance of understanding the larger settlement patterns and how this contributes to our uh, knowledge <coughs> of how uh, humans live in the past. Also, it is very interesting that you brought up uh, what you said about cultures being co-evil rather than sequential. 
um, I found that very interesting and and um, very enlightening. Actually, uh, I I might have missed it, John. But what did you say was the the date of the deposit with the rice starch? What was that? Around the uh, twenty four, twenty five hundred uh, uh, BP, four to five thousand years ago. Quite old. Oh, okay. So it's about now again. Well, the same as uh, or around the same uh, time as the Andarayan site in Solana, Cagayan. A little earlier. A little earlier. A little but, earlier, uh, even. It's, it's uh -huh. coeval. If it's coeval with rice remains that were found over in Borneo. Uh huh. And uh, there have been there's been some work uh, with that. That was actual, I think, rice glooms that were found. It, was it Nia Cave? I have to remember now, but it was over in the area of those caves. And uh, uh, I, I think I think we need to be looking at movements into the Philippines mm -hmm. from the south toward the north rather than from the north to the south. <laughs> we could have a long discussion about that. But uh, uh -huh. this rice starch, it, there could the caveat here is there could be mobility in the uh, uh, in the uh, profiles in the uh, in the, in the, uh, the, the strata. Um, but uh, it, it, it's in a heavy glade deposit, so it's possible it's actually originally deposited in that in that part of that uh, marsh environment. If that's the case, is it wild rice? We're not sure. It's hard to distinguish that. Uh, but even uh, if it's uh, uh, a semi-domesticated or a fully domesticated rice, is it then probably a, a Swidden rice? Um, I think what's going on in Andorian, and we're about to publish an article in Asian Perspectives on the project I did there uh, a few years ago. Uh, we got paleoenvironmental data and dates from a higher series of deposits from the Andorian site. And uh, they show a long period of stability in the environment from, from the pollen and analysis. Uh, there's rice starch in some of those environments, but they're post and inside deposition. Uh, and pottery all is very similar over a 2000 year period. So it makes me feel that there's long continuity in these traditions or, or life ways. If this is a Neolithic life way, it may have been going on and it been, may have been in extent for, for two or 3000 years, you know, uh, and the Ayn Rand fits right into that. So anyway, though, the sites, on the Cagayan River flood plain. In my opinion, were probably they were probably farming rice rate of flooding, the water would settle and then uh, and then go down and they could scatter rice seeds in that in that environment. And as they germinated and grew up, they grew up as wild, not cultivated. They weren't in cultivated terraces. They didn't qualify as wet rice production. And Stephen Akabat and I have talked a lot about this, how wet rice demands a different kind of social organization, a different kind of social unit. Uh, dry rice can be a Swidden farming method. And uh, that appears to be what was going on under Ryan and in those other deposits that we just are publishing in Asian Perspectives right now. But I would think the same thing would have been true in Cebu. If, if that's uh, not wild rice, then I would suspect it's probably from... Uh, uh, either hillside Swidden rice or maybe even there say similarly near that marsh it may have also been like a flood floodplain uh, uh, retreat plantings how how different or how similar are the evidence that you are finding about these cultures uh, in the Visayas compared to let's say uh, Stephen Acabado's uh, studies in in the north in, in Luzon, specifically in the north. Well, Are I, you seeing I, any similarities? Oh, sure. Uh, except that there in, in, in Ifugao, the documentation, the evidence for rice farming is, is, is very recent and really does uh, come post-Spanish uh, uh, intrusion into the area. Uh, before that, we have really good evidence that it's uh, that, that there were some pond fields there, but they were developed for taro and other wetland crops. Uh, and actually, I, I contributed to that project with the stratigraphic analysis and the paleoenvironmental uh, profiles and columns that were collected. So uh, 
it's very similar uh, to uh, in the older parts of that to, to other parts of the Philippines, but the later part was an historic uh, was historically contingent. It was based upon a group of extremely resilient people who found a way to uh, move into a mountain environment, take advantage of a landscape that was being used for other kinds of agriculture, redevelop it for a more higher uh, production value and also for a higher ritual, uh, sort of socially cohesive value. And they managed to uh, re maintain their, their culture uh, for a, a few hundred years. For uh, yeah, we should say, but so to think part with the same kind of historical development of I'm aware of at this point. Was John cutting out or was that my signal, Edo? Um, it said Dr. Peterson's uh, internet, but maybe Dr. Peterson, you can. Um, would it be okay to repeat your final point? Oh, well, just that I think the earlier part of that settlement history has parallels in throughout the Philippines and in the Visayas, mm -hmm. but I'm not aware of any other historical, late historical uh, rice, uh, wetland rice developments in the South, like in Ifuga. It's certainly not in the Visayas. Could be wrong, but I mean, there, there are always discoveries, <laughs> which is wonderful part of our field, but I right. don't know of any. Thank you, John. I have one last question. For the sake of those who are joining us but are not from our field or, or related fields like geology, would you kindly uh, differentiate or, or tell us what is a tectite and what is an obsidian? How, how is obsidian formed? <laughs> right. Well, a tectite is splatter from a, what, an asteroid, Alfred? I, I guess it struck, struck, this particular one struck South China. 700,000 years ago and splattered them all over the Philippines. And I think, I think some have been reported even as far as Australia. Is that correct? I, I was reading in, in Byers' Tektite book that he, where he documented these. Anyway, yeah. they're found all over the Philippines. And where they're found, they indicate association with a land surface that would have been exposed at the time they were ejected 700,000 years ago. There have been tectites found, and, and this is what first got Bayer uh, excited about the Kalinga rhino. They're found in the soil matrix around the rhino. Uh, so he was confident of the date right off the bat. Uh, and uh, we're finding them in landscapes uh, in Cebu, which he had reported one or two, his collectors, his informants had found some up in the highlands. Farmers will find them and they'll sell them as kind of knickknacks. They don't really know what they are, but they're you know, they'll sell them for a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, we found some then in Badian, like I said, and they were on a deflating land surface. So it wasn't the original 700,000 year surface, but mixed in with that could be uh, ev other evidence of uh, human settlement. Uh, we, we've got a lot more exploring to do on those landforms. But the other possibility is to look for maybe rock shelters. Uh, the, uh, well, the old... Uh, uh, Bubalensis find was in a rock shelter, I think, uh, near uh, near Guadalupe in the western side of Cebu, uh, that was published a, a few years ago. It was a fossilized uh, version. Sorry, mosquitoes. <laughs> and uh, so we were, we're, we'll be always looking for shelters and things, and 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 rock shelter deposits where we can find paleofauna, if not maybe hopefully also human settlement. So that's a tectite. Now the obsidian is a volcanic glass, and it's actually part of the uh, formation uh, of volcanic. Uh, it's been volcanic explosions, and uh, it's one one uh, one part of the volcanic explosion, so forth. But it's uh, it's silica that's that's uh, uh, solidifying as it rapidly cools. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite different origin than the tectites. And the tectites, as I understand it, are more metallic. Uh, the, the obsidian is pure glass, and that's why it's so. Oh, 
seems to. I think we lost John's signal. I think I just. Yeah, I think I disconnected for a second. I'm back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're back. I'm back. So. So, thank you, thank you for more, answering this question. Any more questions? We're about to, we're we're about to head up the hill now. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Group just. <laughs> so sorry, you guys can't join us. I'd love to take you up the hill and we can look for a more. Of it. I really agree. You. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll have a cold beer or two and uh, call it a day. Yeah, we, we definitely miss that here, uh, no doubt about it. You, uh, if, before you go, just very quickly, uh, you, 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 you briefly mentioned another exciting find: uh, the, the the bone of of Tamarau. Uh, if I if I remember in was was that in the in the Jesuit house as well? Oh yes, dated to somewhere associated with the uh, 15th century. Yes, yeah, pre-Spanish, and we got really good stratigraphy. It was a wetland environment. It was a marsh. And so there's excellent preservation and the things I showed you like the tamarind, uh, the, uh, the horn cores from the tamarau and uh, the chicken remains. I'm hopeful Michael will be able to get DNA out of those. And uh, uh, a lot of artifactual material. It's just really a fascinating project. We've got, I've included, we've included bits of pieces of that material in other publications, but uh, we, we'll need to do a whole monograph on that Jesuit house. And we, there are, more of those posts being developed so the owner and our sponsor there jimmy c has invited us to come back and do more work uh, i think it'll be very productive so we hope to do that also it's all indoors it, you know <laughs> during very hot weather it's a great site to work on um uh, it's uh partly air conditioned i have to say it's a, these sites will spoil you down here <laughs> <laughs> sounds marvelous huh? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's quite interesting. So until the 15th century, while Tamaraus are now confined to to Mindoro, uh, in the 15th century, you you had them uh, in the Visayas in Cebu as well. That late, we found another one was found by Nita uh, Cueva and uh, mm -hmm. Sai Kalugai at the Baxi site that I first worked on. Uh, and I think the date on that was about five or 600 AD, something in that range. Uh, and and this that was worked on by Angel Batista. Uh, this one would be the, the most recent one that I'm aware of. So they may have well been uh, uh, around when the Spanish came. Oh, and then, so I have to say, so some of these slides, when I was doing the presentation, some of the slides had fallen out of order somehow. I'm not sure what happened. But at the Patria site, we found a, a buried animal, this was toward the end of, end of the project, in a, a very sandy alluvial plain. We thought that, that the, that the uh, Jesuit house, I mean, the uh, Patria was going to have burials under, under the bishop's residencia, much like Plaza Independencia. It turned out to be a very sterile floodplain environment, leading us to now posit another old relic channel just adjacent to it, that, where the land that the Patria on then would have been a overbank flooding, right? Anyway, within the matrix of that sterile gravel was a, was a pit of mug, mud, and in the pit is a horse burial, a horse skeleton. And uh, we've, we've uh, excavated it. Archie is uh, doing biometric analysis. We're working with Noel Amano to determine. We're not really sure yet. There's Wan Lee pottery in some of the deposits around it, which would be early Spanish period. But there's some indication this could be a pre-Spanish horse in, in Cebu. Uh, an Asian horse, and we know there were some records of horses coming in with some of the Chinese expeditions. So it's not uh, um, there's it's not out of the realm of possibilities. But uh, you know, uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, we, we we either have the latest pre-Spanish horse or the first Spanish horse, 
and uh, it was, uh, we think, probably foundered in a in a mud pit on that uh, floodplain and died. Uh, it didn't appear to be ceremonially buried. It didn't have anything with it, but in the mud around it were a few scattered artifacts dating to the Wan Lee period. So I, yeah, the, the the for some reason the slides of the horse dropped out of the presentation, but that's another exciting find: the tamara, but also the horse. Definitely. Wow, more, more exciting finds to come. So the, the horse has no cut marks on the bones, I suppose, then, or anything? Well, Archie's had it, and you know, we had a typhoon here on December 16th, and he and I haven't been much in touch since then. <laughs> he didn't have power back till a couple of weeks ago. We'll learn soon. And uh, he's also in touch with Mike Herrera about the chicken bones from Jesuit House. So we've got a lot of things pending, but between the coronavirus and the typhoon, we're uh, we're we're a, a little challenged here. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Ada, do we have uh, other questions from the audience? We have one, but um, can Dr. Peterson still accommodate the question, or yeah, you might have to go back to yeah. your fieldwork. Dr. This connection's been pretty good, but it's it's starting to get a little unstable. But I'll, yeah, let's give it a try. All right. So um, maybe our final question from Charlemagne. Uh, Sir, during your exploration in Low Ibohol, did you find an obsidian, particularly in Tagbu, Tagbuan, Alburquerque? Did I say that correct? Tagbuan, Alburquerque. Other obsidian where? In Tagbuan. Tabuelan? Is that correct? Um, Tagbuan, Albuquerque. Is that on the chat? Yes, it's in the chat. Albuquerque. Oh, in Bohol. Oh, no, I haven't done. Uh, okay, Albuquerque, Bohol. No, I haven't uh, done survey there. Uh, uh, let me know and we'll come over and scout around with you <laughs> we'll have to get a permit of course with a never-ending struggles with the with the in, now the ncca but uh yeah that would be fabulous if you know of any or if you found of any found any yeah keep an eye on on the locations and we'll try to join a project andrea yankowski works a lot in behold too and might be quite interested probably near albuquerque too would probably be quite interested in talking to you about that if whenever she's back in the philippines so Char Charlemagne, keep in touch. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peterson. Um, hello. Uh, oh. Yes, I think that's Athena. Do you want to say something, Athena? Oh. Yeah, sorry, I can't open my video because I'm um, um not too good on signal. Uh Someone gave me a tech tight. Actually, um, uh, Mr. Joselito Alipala, Andrea Yankowski's um, assistant when she was here. So he also, um, he, he got this from Albor Kirky, from Albor as well. And um, I, I sent... Um, yeah. so I sent photos of the tech tight to, to, um, Mr. to Dr. Fuentes. <laughs> Yeah, Athena is our batchmate in field school before. You think it was a tech type, not an obsidian? Um, yeah, it looks like a tech type. It has bubbles and um, uh, the, the shape is um, like tech type as well. Well, we'll, we'll try to get over there. Uh, I'm always curious. And I, there are some sites there that are open, public sites that I haven't visited, so I'm always eager to get over there. Now that Bohol is open, I think that's something I wouldn't mind doing. It's easy to get there. One of our students just came here from Bohol. Uh, he had a rough crossing a couple of days ago uh, on the fast cats. And the waves were up above the window occasionally, but he, but he uh, stoically uh, hung in there. Uh, but uh, anyway, because of the coronavirus and other and and the typhoon abating a bit, we, we could probably get there sometime. 
in the next several months. So if, if we do, I'll keep a note of this. Maybe we can uh, maybe we can meet up. That would be great. Or if you come to Cebu. Yeah, sure, sir. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, Miss Audrey Tomada is my um, my head head here in Boston. <laughs> I think you know her. <laughs> oh, yeah, Audrey, of course. <laughs> yeah. Audrey Tomata. Yeah, I want to see the new museum there, too. I haven't. Uh, it's fabulous. You're working there? Uh, yes, but um, our galleries are still closed. Uh, some, uh, like one gallery oh. was uh, affected by the typhoon. Well, we'll uh, uh, we'll try to get there sometime to visit. Then I know exactly where to find you now. Then once it opens, <laughs> yes, sir, in the middle of town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, John. And I, I think we should not hold you up any longer uh, from your amazing field work and. and from your pleasant environment where <laughs> you are right now. <laughs> so many thanks for, for being with us, for, for spending your precious time and, and presenting us with this really rich uh, chest of, of archeological information and, and finds and, and wonderful data uh, about your research. It was really amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks to the audience for joining us again. And I think before we end, uh, let us announce the talk for next week. Uh, it will be Dr. Donald Johansson, who will talk about the continuing importance of Australopithecus afarensis, particularly Lucy, the famous uh, fossil that uh, Don Johansson discovered uh, and, and made uh, change so much of, of uh, our human history. Uh, reminder, the talk will be at 11.30 Manila time. So not the usual 2 p.m., 11.30 a.m. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Uh, thank you again, John. Thank you for coming. And I hope we see each other very soon, uh, in person, preferably. Yes. Yes, let's do that. <laughs>